Today I show you how to create your own network attached storage device, install hard drive inside an externalized hard drive casing, and I have a brand new panic trick just for you on this episode of your technology questions answered. <laughs> Welcome to the 38th episode of Your Technology Questions Answered, where today we'll be talking about creating your own network attached storage device on the cheap. I'm your host, T. Smith, aka Z Axis, and yes, me call me that, and we are June 19th, 2011. So many of you have hundreds, if not thousands, of audio files, MP3s, photos, videos, and movies on our hard drives. Some of us are starting to run out of space. Today, we will address this issue by explaining the process of creating your own network attached storage device without buying any expensive gear whatsoever. We're going to do this through a series of eight questions. I'm going to demonstrate how to install a hard drive inside various devices designed to carry data through a USB port and I will explain everything you need to know and at the end of this episode I'll explain a brand new panic trick to get you out of any trouble that arises from getting through this whole process. So let's talk about a few things. There are many routers out there that have a USB port on the back. We've got to look at this. This is what makes this whole process works. If you have ACES, D-Link, Belkin, any type of router and it has a USB port on the back, I'll explain how to verify if it is compatible with this technique. So, like I said, I'm going to demonstrate how to create one, but let's start question by question. So the first question is, how much storage space will you need? Well, folks, we're going to come into what we call the normality of things. If you have any amount of MP3s and videos and photos and home videos, you're going to need a lot more space than you might imagine. So let's imagine you go to a computer store and you need to buy yourself a hard drive to get this all working. I'm suggesting between 45 and 65 dollars will give you anywhere from 500 gigs to a terabyte of space. You can go up to maybe 125 dollars for two terabytes. Most people will be fine between 500 gigs and a terabyte. Give you an idea, I've got about 20 gigs of an iTunes folder. So if you're anything like me, you'll be able to get all your stuff down into 500 gigs. Now, what kind of external case should I purchase? anything you like. I'm going to show you three, but it can be any color you want, it can be any design you want. Bear in mind the majority of the cases that I will suggest are range between twenty to forty five dollars. Anything higher has novelty items on it that you may or may not use whatsoever. So buy any case you want. Bearing in mind if you buy anything with extra features on it, you'll pay a little more. But if you don't want to pay that much, don't worry about it any case of the USB port will do. Is my current router compatible with this technique? This is the third question and it is very important. Most routers that have a USB port in the last few years had a printer port only port on the back. Some of the newer ones actually have an externalized USB port interface but this requires software. So the easiest way to figure out if your router is compatible is A, does it have a USB port on the back? If it does, you go to step B. Step B, in the box, is there a utility CD that allows you to install a special type of software in there? Usually, if you need software to make this run, it's usually a good sign that you can use it for more than just printing. I've had routers that didn't even need the software, but you had to identify the router as the printer port. So, there's also another way, it's read the manual. It's always written in the manual if you can do more than one thing with it. It'll be written in the box printer port, but in the manual it'll tell you specifically what it can do. The fourth question, and this is where I'll do the demo, how does one install a hard drive inside a hard drive case or cradle? 
Let's get to the demonstration. Putting together an external hard drive isn't anywhere as hard as anybody thinks. For the most part, you've got several different kinds. You've got the small ones for the laptop hard drives. You've got the bigger ones for the conventional hard drives. And then you've got what I call the toasters, which are just cradles, by the way, where you just plug in the hard drives. So this I'll leave to last because it's a little bit more interesting. Let's start off with the small one. Now, as you can see, it's completely self-contained. All you do is connect a USB port to the back and then it powers off the drive. Now obviously routers don't have that much power so you might need to use the DC part of this thing. So you just have to open it up. Now of course, we'll put that to the side. This is the base, the control card that actually uses the hard drive. Here at the bottom is where you see the connection for the hard drive. Now the hard drive that connects to this is a small little laptop drive. Bear in mind you need clean hands and do not under any circumstance shock these with any static electricity. You want to be very careful. In my environment here it's very humid so we don't have that much problems with static. In a more dry area you're going to have to use any static bracelet. So take this drive. No you don't really need to see what's written but I know it's pretty bright. Take the drive and plug it in like this. On the back you have four places where you have to put screws. So take your truss heel screwdriver and start putting in the screws. Now obviously I can explain all this and there's a lot of people that would understand what I mean by this. Hold on, screw doesn't want to go on. But some people actually learn through doing or seeing other people do. So for this reason, I'm actually going to build it for you. And I'm going to do three different types. That way, if you buy any of these three types, you'll be fine. You don't want to lose any screws, people, though. Try asking for a screw you can't name. Obviously, if you go into my show notes, I refer to making sure that you plug in the hard drive light before closing. In this case, the hard drive light is in front of my finger. It's soldered to the board, so we don't have to worry about it. Now, find the slot that it slides in. Slide it in carefully. Make sure it doesn't jam. Put in the final screws. They're just out of range of the camera. They're right in front of me. Next one. No people, don't worry about it. This is not a race. That's the first one. You have completed drive. With its cradle that holds it, it can now stand. So let's put this right here. Now let's work on the second one. This is the type that most people end up buying in a store. You can buy anything you want. It could be pink, red, blue, silver, any color you want. I prefer black because it matches my computer box. Now, open up the case. It's the same thing as we just did, only because the hard drive is bigger, they've actually been able to reduce the size of the board to one little part of the box. Obviously, you take your hard drive and you plug in the ports. In our case, though, like I said in the show notes, you have to watch about the actual pins here because right beside the finger, this is where the hard drive activity light plugs in. Now 
again, we screw it in. Bearing in mind, never over screw. You want to be able to remove this in the future if you want to upgrade the hard drive or replace it because it fails. Or remove the hard drive if the box fails, which usually never happen. Your hard drive will fail first. There. It's locked in. The next step that you have to deal with is putting it back in the cradle. Attempting not to make too much noise for the microphone. Now, just before you seal it, you have to plug in the activity light, then seal it. Now, we put the two screws. Now these screws prevent the box from opening by accident or anything because you can get a nasty shock if you were to leave this open. You can but it's at your own risk and don't sue me if you get shocked. It's even written in the instruction manual. There. Completely sealed. And this too, ironically, comes with its own case despite the fact it has feet. Let's move this one here. Now, like I said, I tend to like gadgets. This is called a Black, Black X Duet. It's from Thermaltake, came out maybe two years ago. But I call it a toaster because it's got independent switches to release each of the hard drives. And installing a hard drive in this thing is fairly simple. Just drop and plug. And that's it. Now. Take the back of any of these drives, where the USB port is, take a cable, and you plug it into this part on your router. Now, it's not exactly like this on every router, but this is a D-Link, and for the most part, can I hide the top light? Yay, you can see it. Dang it. For the most part, they're similar. Now, let's get on to the next question. Question five is, what kind of a partition should I use when I format the drive? The partition should be universally compatible with all your equipment. If you've only got computers in the house and they all run Windows, go on right ahead. NTFS is going to be best for you and on top of it, it supports large files over 4 gigabytes in size. Now if you want to be universally accessible throughout all your equipment, let's say you have consoles like a PS3 or something, you're going to need to run a FAT32 partition. Otherwise, NTFS won't be read, and some of this equipment doesn't know what to do with that, and it won't be backwards compatible. So, if you've only got Windows computers in your house, Linux and Macintosh are also compatible for this. NTFS, go on right ahead. But if you want to be universally compatible, run a FAT32 partition table. Otherwise, nothing else except your computers will be able to read that drive. What is the final step to creating a working NAS drive? Network attached storage. After we know that it's been formatted correctly and that you've put it together correctly and if you've plugged it into the router, obviously it won't work out of the box. So what is this final step? Install the software that came with the router itself. In the case of D-Link, it's called the share port utility. This is what allows the computer to use that external USB port as a virtual USB port inside your computer. This means you'll finally be able to connect to it and use it as though it was plugged directly into your computer, which is the whole point of this project. And here's the most important thing you got to worry about. Is there a way to allow multiple users to use the same device at the same time? So is it possible for more than one user to use this NAS drive? The answer is no. Unless you use the share utility in Windows to share it as a folder, and that you install on every single computer in the house. A shared folder that points directly to this, there is no other way of sharing it towards multiple people at the same time. And for the most part, NAS drives don't technically allow you to do that at the same time either, because there is always the danger that somebody tries to write to the same file as you. So to prevent anything from happening like that, 
it won't allow you to do anything to the drive if there's more than one person on it or it just doesn't let you on the drive period if somebody else is on it but bear in mind the software used to share the hard drive does allow you to do something that notifies another user using it that you need it so in the, in the case of the SharePort utility you can request the drive from another user so don't necessarily have to worry about anything if your son or daughter or wife or husband is using the drive and you needed to save something you just request and they transfer a voluntary decision nothing to worry about then after now the final question can this drive be infected by malware and viruses yes bear in mind the only way you're gonna get infected is through the abuse of this so only turn it on when you're convinced that the drive that you're using in your computer is in fact clean and by the way you can scan this external hard drive using your own antivirus inside your computer so you can periodically scan the drive and make sure it's not infected and if you're worried about teenagers and kids infecting the drive just don't install the utility on their computers that way there is no chance of being infected now if you have any further questions or comments on the subject or want to add in your own input or show off your external hard drive just add it as a video reply to my video on YouTube or email me at tqa at zaxis.net. This week's panic trick is based on this question I've bought a new hard drive casing and I have a router that is external storage enabled. Good. I installed the software and read the manual. And when the software loads, everything works fine except that I cannot see the hard drive in the Windows Explorer. What's wrong? For the most part, Windows Explorer, when it's actually looking for all the hard drives, is looking for a partition table. This is what's missing on the hard drive. In order to create a partition table on the drive, you could use the Windows software to do so, but as anybody who's ever hunted for it has ever told you, it's virtually impossible to find, or you have to Google it and go through a bunch of instructions. My suggestion is the software, EASIS, Partition Master Home Edition which is available in my show notes at www.zedaxis.net. The links in the show notes, the instructions are on the website as well. I've already used the software and I've already made an episode on this software. So you can go back to one of my past episodes to show you how it works. But this software solution is absolutely free. And once you run it, whatever remaining issue you have will simply just disappear. Next week, we'll be talking about the mysterious HDMI graphics cards. You know those things that no longer have S video on the back? They actually have an HDMI port. They contain something called 7.1 surround sound for the most part, which creates these four mysterious sound cards where the drivers don't exist on the CDs. Next week, I will address that issue and explain how to solve it all in one shot. So, until next week, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to my show. Don't forget to head over to the show notes to see all the information possible with all the links to everything I have talked about today and previously. Don't forget to do a listener survey and all the information you need about this podcast, how to support it, and everything is on the website at www.zedaxis.net. Remember to stay safe and online. Have a great weekend. Happy Father's Day. This has been your technology questions answered.